So inflammation is kind of the, the word we bandy around a lot, uh, and, uh, but it's, it's, it's actually what kills most people, uh, the inflammatory process. But it's not the acute inflammatory process that we're all aware of when we get an infection like a gastro or a sore throat. Uh, it's the chronic, low-grade, long-term, systemic inf uh, inflammation that's a problem. So we've identified which circuits are contributing to the electric field exposure. You just park this straight between his toes. Do you have any toe pressure? <laughs> when we're getting macro doses of these toxic metals uh, and elements. Now we're looking at 51, 15. Now we're looking at 6,000. 6,000 microvolts. So. It's actually what kills most people, uh, the inflammatory process. But... And then you can see there are two LEDs and one receiver. The room has already been shielded with a shielding paint. That's grounded, so that's going to catch one of those electric fields from the wiring. We will bump into occasionally, not often, but I can guarantee you, you bump into it. Welcome everybody, thank you for tuning in. Today we'll be talking about radio frequency radiation. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm here with uh, Dr. John Hart here in, uh, in Sydney. Um, John is a uh, functional medicine practitioner with a particular interest in brain health. And um, we've been kind of working together for a little while and I thought it would be interesting for you to um, hear some of the things that, uh, that John and his clinic do. Uh, so John, thank you very much for uh, spending some time with us. You're welcome, um, Patrick. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, what, uh, what do you do? So we have a clinic in Sydney that uh, uses functional medicine uh, principles to assess people's health. We'll assess anybody who walks through the door, but our particular interest is brain health. So people who realise their brain's not working properly or they may not realise because they're not aware that some of the symptoms they're experiencing are due to an underfunctioning brain. Um, and uh, we look at the reasons why people's brains are not operating properly and uh, there's, there's a whole lot of uh, possible reasons, either things that are supposed to be in the brain, so good things that keep the brain healthy like hormones, vitamins, minerals, exercise, sleep, or too many bad things in the brain that damage the brain leading to dysfunction, so things like heavy metal toxicity, electromagnetic radiation exposure, uh, chronic infections, allergies, stress, not enough movement, not enough exercise, not enough sleep. Uh, so we, we work on the model that uh, at the end of adolescence, that's when your brain is at its biggest and healthiest. You have about 85 billion brain cells, but that we all start losing on average about 8,000 brain cells a day fr from our 20s. And the rate at which we lose that varies tremendously between different people, depending on what you do to your brain over your life. So if you have a lot of good things going into your brain, as I mentioned, the exercise, vitamins, minerals, fats, proteins, um, stress, uh, stress management, uh, sleep, sunlight, and you don't have too many bad things going into your brain, uh, like the electromagnetic radiation, heavy metal toxicity, chronic infections in your body and in your brain, uh, food allergies, etc. the chemicals from the environment, from in our food, our air, our water, or that you put on your skin. Um, it, uh, it's the balance between those good factors or what, what are called neurotrophic factors or um, growth factors and neurotoxic factors, the bad things that damage our brain and lead to dysfunction and eventually brain cell death. Uh, it's the balance between those that determines whether you end up as a, an elderly person with an active brain and a vital and independent life or you spend the last 20 or 30 years um, in, in a state of decline and poor memory and poor attention, poor mood control. So the things that a healthy brain does for you as part of the system of the body, the brain's just part of a complicated system, which is our body, and uh, it has particular functions as all the organs in the body have. 
and uh, the brain's functions are mood control, uh, memory and attention, um, cognition, you know, planning things, multitasking, um, controlling your libido, controlling your sleep and, and controlling the rest of the body. And if you have a healthy brain, then all those things work well. So you're happy, you're enthusiastic, you're vital, you've got good concentration, good memory and recall, you sleep well, you've got a good libido, you can multitask and deal with lots of processing, lots of information at once. And usually you'll have a healthy body at the same time. Whereas if your brain um, is in a state of decline, then the brain doesn't work as well. And you might notice that initially as poor mood control. So you might have some anxiety or depression or irritability or anger or sadness. You, you um, have poor memory and attention, so you can't concentrate as well. You get fatigued when you try and concentrate for long periods of time. You can't remember uh, what you did uh, if you're reading a book, you know, you, still, you can't remember a couple of pages ago or you walk into a room and you can't remember why you walked in there or where you put the keys a few hours ago. Um, but you know, so declining cognition, sleep, libido, all the things that the brain does start to decline. And the way I think about it is that initially the brain cells are there and if you're getting an accelerated decline, then initially you'll lose function. So that if you do a CT or an MRI of your brain, you'll still have the brain cells there. So the CT and MRI will look normal. You'll be reported as normal because it is, but those brain cells are not working properly. And you, you, you may be aware of that uh, because of you know, loss of some of the functions of the brain, um, but it's not showing up structurally yet. But if the process continues with the imbalance between the good and the bad things, the neurotoxic and neurotrophic factors, then uh, eventually you start to get death of brain cells and after a certain number die, it becomes detectable with the technology we have at the moment with MRIs and CTs. So you'll start to see shrinkage in, in different parts of the brain and the brain overall. Um, so so that's, that's the overall model we're looking at is trying to identify as many of the neurotrophic factors that a person should have that, that they don't have that we can replace uh, or we can get them to replace because uh, that's the first thing to, that I tell everybody, I, I don't fix anybody, I've never fixed anybody, never will. I just use the science that we have available to tell them what they need to do to improve their health and it's up to them whether they do it or not. So we identify the neurotrophic factors that are missing and get them to tell them how they might replace them, uh, either make them themselves or put them in from outside their body um, or and identify the neurotoxic factors that uh, they have in their body or, and or in their brain, uh, as much as the technology now allows us to, to uh, and remove those as much as we can to minimize the damage being done. Because it's all, all part of um, this cognitive decline that we're all on the path of, but we're all on it at our own rate. Um, initially, uh, you know, we put, in medicine, we like to put labels on things. So initially, if, if you're, you're aware your brain's not working like it was, uh, but all the tests come back normal, well, we call that subjective cognitive impairment. So you're aware of your cognition being impaired, but the tests are all, you're within the normal range. Now you might be at the bottom end of the normal range, or you might have gone from the top end to the middle of the normal range, and that's a, definitely a decline for you, but you're still inside the normal range. Um, but if you keep doing what you're doing, you'll, you'll continue to get what you get, which means you'll get a continuing decline and eventually the tests start to become abnormal and that you then get the label of mild cognitive impairment and if you don't do anything about it then often the process will continue and you'll get a label of dementia once you can't look after yourself anymore. So dementia just means brain failure, it means the brain can't do its job of you looking after yourself, managing your life, managing your body properly. And it's just like we have heart failure when the heart doesn't work as a pump. We have liver failure when the liver doesn't work as a filter. We have or a, a processor and the kidney failure when, when the, the kidneys don't work as a, a filter. So uh, brain failure it has its own special name called dementia, but uh, it's just brain failure. It's the, that organ's lost its ability to operate uh, well enough that you can look after yourself. Um, so we're, we're all about uh, trying to find as many things to fix as possible by doing extensive testing. And, and we don't know all the things that affect the brain and 
Many of the things that do affect the brain we can't do hard tests for yet. We don't have the technology. But we do have a huge number of tests that we can do to identify neurotrophic uh, good factors that are missing and neurotoxic bad factors that are present and, and all of which we can do something about. You know, we don't test for things that we can't fix. That's a waste of everybody's time and money. Um, so our testing is, is revolves around, uh, I guess it's, it's, it's two categories. One is assessing the function and structure of the brain as it is right now, as a baseline. So things like uh, uh, MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging of the physical structure of the brain, uh, combined with 3D volumization, which is measuring the 3D volume of different structures in the brain, okay. uh, and then comparing it with other people of the same age and sex. So you can, uh, A, you get a baseline of where you're at now for retesting later on if you wish to, but B, you can see where you are compared to um, your colleagues in the co same cohort you're in. Um, there, and other, other tests like SPEC scans or PET scans, which are scans that, uh, they're nuclear medicine scans, but they, they assess the metabolic health of the brain cells, so how healthy the cells are, how well they can metabolize uh, glucose or uh, energy in general. And uh, so they might be there on MRI, but they're not there on PET scan, which means they're not working properly or not okay. compared to how they should be for other people of the same age and sex. Um, and then we do neurocognitive assessments. So these are computerized assessments looking at the ultimate output of brain function, things like um, memory, attention, reaction time, processing speed, perceptual flexibility. So once again, you can compare your results, your speed and your accuracy in those tests with other people of the same age and sex, and as well as getting a baseline for where you're at for comparing in the future, just to see where you are at um, with, the, with other people of the same age and sex. Um, so we do those sort of functional structural tests for the brain. But the other part of the model we have is that if you have brain dysfunction, usually it's not just a brain disease, it's actually a whole body disease because the, the brain relies on the body to supply it with nutrition and not supply it with toxins. And mm -hmm. so if you have um, problems in your body where it's not doing that job properly, then your brain will start to fail. And then your brain's not controlling your body properly, so then your body starts to fail and you end up with this spiral where the whole system starts to break. As, as more things break, then they cause other things in the system to, to fail. So the symptoms could be incredibly wide-ranging, I'm guessing. That's right, because the brain's involved in just about Every, everything, everything you do. So, um, you know, as I said, it's, it could be just memory. So the first, often the first thing that people notice or that their friends and family notice is, is mood changes. It might be just a little bit of depression or a little bit of anxiety that wasn't there 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So something's changed. Um, and so that's uh, usually some inflammation in the brain that's stopping the brain from working properly. Um, uh, uh, one of the early signs of you know, Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, which can both end up with dementia just via slightly different pathways, is a loss of sense of smell. So the nasal nerves that transmit um, uh, information from the nasal cavity up to the brain, they can also transmit infections and toxins into the brain and, get, and they get damaged in the, that process. And you might notice that the first thing you notice is you can't smell things like you used to. And you might blow okay. that off as nothing significant, but it's how, one of the ways by which the, the, the brain decline starts because it's an access point for toxins into the brain. Okay. Um, so inflammation's kind of the, the word we bandy around a lot. Uh, and, uh, but it's, it's, it's actually what kills most people. Uh, the inflammatory process, but it's not the acute inflammatory process that we're all aware of when we get an infection like a gastro or a sore throat. Uh, it's the chronic, low-grade, long-term, systemic inf uh, inflammation that's a problem. So I'll just I'll do a quick diversion on inflammation. Yeah, yeah please do. Everybody's heard the word, but not everybody knows what it means. So inflammation is the process that our immune system evolved over millions of years to deal with the things that used to kill us. And what used to kill us was infections and trauma uh, when we were out in the jungle. So uh, if you get trauma to a part of your body and it gets damaged, the tissue is damaged, or if you get an infection in part of your body, chemicals are released which alert your immune system, 
who is and your immune system's job is to surveil for infections and trauma and the moment it sees something that looks like that to go on to a full alert full not even alert to full uh, operational mode to fix it yep. so so what happens is that the chemicals are released in the area where the infection or is or the trauma has occurred and the damaged tissue is and uh, these chemicals cause the blood vessels in the area to dilate so more blood goes to the area and that's why the area looks redder and feels warmer and the blood vessels get a bit leaky so that cells that are attracted to the area can get out of the blood vessels and get into the tissue and those cells eat the damaged tissue and they eat the infectious agent whether it's a bacteria or a virus or whatever um, and then other cells come in and they repair the damage and once that's all fixed then the whole process settles down and goes away um, so so you in that acute inflammatory response you get the redness and the heat from the increased blood flow you get swelling because fluid leaks out up through the leaky blood vessels which have to get leaky to let the cells out so you get the swelling in the area and you get pain from the chemicals that are released but once the initiating agents where trauma infection um, is is repaired or removed then the inflammation settles down and goes away so it's an acute sort of fairly rapid onset uh, localized short-term inflammatory response and that's mother nature at its best the people who were good at that survived so they were able to if they got an infection they were able to get rid of it before it spread through their body and killed them and if they got trauma they were able to repair the trauma and continue on being a very effective hunter-gatherer mm. and surviving um, but the problem now is that in the last uh, couple hundred years whereas infections and trauma were the major killers up until a few hundred years ago especially in the last hundred years the major cause of death in Western society particularly is chronic low-grade inflammation leading to collateral damage which then manifests as a heart attack a stroke cancer dementia okay. diabetes osteoporosis or whatever so if if the immune system sees things that it perceives as foreign invaders like an infection or signs of tissue damage or actual tissue damage it will just do what it's programmed to do which is go out and launch this inflammatory response but if these signs are happening all over the body and at a low grade then you don't get redness and swelling and heat and pain you might even not even know it's happening because it's at such a low level but it's happening every day for decades then you get the collateral damage so you get collateral damage to your blood vessels so your blood vessels get damaged over time you don't feel it happening you might maybe your blood pressure might go up maybe not uh, and then eventually a blood vessel will burst or block healthy blood vessels don't burst or block spontaneously they they need to be damaged over often decades then they'll burst or block then you get your heart attack or your stroke often with no warning signs um, and you know health healthy cells don't suddenly turn cancerous they yeah. don't start multiplying um, out of control unnecessarily uh, overnight There's, there has to be extended amount of damage done to the DNA both in the mitochondria in the cell which is the energy um, producing center and to the uh, DNA in the nucleus of the cell which is where most of the genes are that control what the cell does um, there's damage done over decades and eventually the cell will start as a response to that damage start uh, either kill itself or start reproducing uncontrollably as a survival mechanism um, and in, in the case of dementia you know we have the 85 billion brain cells at the end of adolescence mm. we're, we're losing on average 8,000 but more or less and um, because of inflammation that's happening in the brain called neuroinflammation triggered by too much bad stuff not enough good stuff so the bad stuff is basically pro-inflammatory triggering inf immune uh, activation in the brain and, and inflammation and collateral damage and the good stuff is anti-inflammatory or trophic so it dampens down inflammation and promotes growth and repair can you give some examples of both yep so um, so neurotrophic factors that are important are uh, so that's bad stuff no you? no neurotrophic's the good stuff oh, sorry yeah. so trophic is Latin for growth I think okay <laughs> so growth promoting factors in the brain or, or anti-inflammatory factors in the brain are things like you know a healthy diet with lots of vitamins and minerals and good quality water and fats and proteins that are good quality 
um, not so much sugar, we don't need sugar. Um, and then, uh, so exercise, having a healthy musculoskeletal system, your muscles make a, uh, a myokine, or they make several hundred myokines, but one of the really important ones for the brain is called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which grows new brain cells and repairs brain cells, and you can make it from having healthy, strong, regularly exercised muscles. Um, obviously, sleep's really important. Sleep is, uh, is when your brain repairs itself. Turns out, it was discovered a couple of years ago, that your brain cells shrink at night when about 60%, uh, to, to about 60% at night when you're sleeping, so that the, uh, and the brain sits in a, sat, a tank, mm -hmm. the skull, of fluid, and there's blood vessels going through the brain, and when the brain cells shrink at night, there's more space between the brain cells, and the blood vessels going through those spaces which are pumping through with the pulse, pump the fluid of the tank through the brain and take out the garbage, the waste products that were accumulated from the day's work. And so if you don't get enough quality or quantity of sleep, then you don't take out the garbage. The garbage um, accumulates and then the you know it the next day because your brain's a bit foggy, you're not working properly, but over time the garbage accumulates and, and leads to uh, damage to the cells and promotes inflammation as your immune system tries to get rid of the garbage. Mm, that makes sense. Um, so exercise, sleep, stress management, you know, too much stress kills brain cells. Uh, the 1990s was the decade of the brain and it was uh, billions of dollars spent on, on brain research in that decade and, and one of the things they found was that prolonged levels of stress and high levels of the sympathetic stress management nervous system activation and high levels of cortisol the sort of stress hormone to activate your body to deal with the stress, yeah. high levels of those over time kill brain cells. Um, so people who have uh, high levels of stress, prolonged, have high levels of cortisol, and uh, they have uh, increased risk of dementia later on in life. Um, so there's some of the, the good things, or sunlight, natural sunlight. So sunlight on your eyes, sunlight on your skin, is not just about um, on your skin making vitamin D, which is actually a very, is actually, it's a hormone, mm -hmm. it's not a vitamin, it's a hormone, because it, it's made in one part of the body, the skin, and, and then via the liver and the kidneys, uh, goes via the blood to all the cells in the body telling them what to do, that's actually a hormone. A vitamin is a vital amine, it's something your body can't make, you have to have in your diet. And vitamin D was called vitamin D because it was first discovered in cod liver oil, and they thought that uh, the body couldn't make it. So it was called vitamin D because somebody had just discovered vitamin C. Okay. But a couple, this was 1921. And then a couple of years later, it was worked out that most of the vitamin D in your body is not dietary. It's, it's made by sunlight on your skin. So if you don't get enough sunlight in your skin, you don't make, make enough vitamin D. Now vitamin D, as well as being anti-cancer and immune system regulatory, it's anti-inflammatory. It's a strong anti-inflammatory hormone. And it's really good for what yeah. we're talking about. So <coughs> That's right. So if you don't get enough sun on your skin, then you don't make enough vitamin D, then that's promoting a, a pro-inflammatory state by not having enough anti-inflammatory, or that anti-inflammatory um, assistance. Uh, so obviously, um, we don't say go out and uh, uh, spend all day in the sun and get sunburn, because sunburn is damage. Hmm. But we also say don't hide from the sun and and work, live and work inside and then play inside and expect to be healthy. Because <laughs> the, body, the body evolved over a million years, millions of years as a hunter-gatherer on the equator. That's how much sun we expect to get on our eyes and on our skin. We evolved mm. into that environment. That environment was there first. We evolved to operate optimally in that. Now we, we've, we've, we're so used to changing our environment now to make it safe and comfortable for us that we think that we've made it more suitable for us, but we haven't. What we've done is we've made it safe and comfortable, but in the process, we've removed a lot of the inputs from our environment that we evolved to use and need, and have made ourselves softer and weaker in the process, and, and that's one of the reasons why the chronic degenerative diseases are, are exploding, because of that loss of appropriate environmental um, interaction that we evolved to have. And you know, electromagnetic radiation is exactly the same scenario as you know. You know, we we evolved into 
into a particular electromagnetic environment. That was here first, and it was determined by the Earth's electromagnetic field, you know, north and south poles, mm -hmm. and by sunlight. And so sunlight is, uh, consists of a, a photon, a little part of, parcel of energy, that moves in a wave form, and uh, some of the photons move at very high frequencies, and uh, we call so very short wavelengths of very high frequencies, and we call those cosmic rays. And then the, the slightly um, slow, lower frequencies, therefore longer wavelengths, are then the gamma and gamma waves and alpha waves, beta waves. Then you get down into the ultraviolet spectrum or X rays below that, and then ultraviolet. And most of that gets filtered out from the sunlight via the Earth's atmosphere, except if you're in Australia, not so much, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and then below that, we have the visible spectrum. So that's the, the sunlight that we can see because we have receptors for that. We can't see these higher ones. We don't have receptors for those, but we have receptors for the visible spectrum, which is a very narrow band of frequencies. And we call that red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And then below that is the infrared spectrum. And the infrared spectrum, we don't see it, but uh, we feel it as heat. So we perceive infrared as heat. And then below that, there wasn't much. There was a little bit of radiation um, at the lo very low frequencies, primarily generated by lightning. So when lightning strikes, and there's about 100 lightning strikes uh, some, every second somewhere in the world, yeah, yeah. But every time the lightning strikes from the ionosphere down to the earth, it, it releases energy that reverberates around in the atmosphere, atmosphere which acts as a cavity between the surface of the earth and the ionosphere, the outer layer. And that's called the Schumann resonance. Uh, and it's at 7.83 hertz, which is a very low frequency compared to the, the many billions of hertz at the higher end. Uh, but uh, so the Schumann resonance is, is kind of the Earth's electromagnetic pulse generated by lightning strikes, 7.83 hertz, reverberating round and round and round, and there's harmonics of it, which are exact multiples of it. So mm -hmm. 7.83 hertz, you know, 16 hertz, 20, uh, whatever the next one is, 24, uh, and up to about 50 or 60 hertz. The, the harmonics get weaker and weaker. And that's interesting because if you look at the frequencies of the human brain, it's the same frequency band. And 7.83 hertz is the frequency your brain goes into when you're alert and active and creative. Yeah. And, and that's not coincidence. That's because that frequency was here first and we evolved as an organism to use that frequency and to operate optimally in it. Um, but, and, and that was fine for millions of years. We, we evolved into being the best hunter-gatherer in that electromagnetic environment. Uh, but then 100 years ago, we totally changed the electromagnetic environment by pumping out man-made, non-native electromagnetic fields. So things like um, radar, radio and TV that are below the visible spectrum, so we can't see them, mm -hmm. but they're there and we can, we've got devices that will enable us to see them. But, uh, but it's particularly gotten bad in the last 10 to 20 years with the microwaves. So the, the radio frequencies, um, which are uh, wavelengths that have in the microwave band, um, they have uh, centimeter wavelengths. They're, uh, they've exploded in the atmosphere all over the earth in the last 10 to 20 years, because they're the frequencies that we're using in our telecommunication industry. As an idea of where this is all coming from, it's, it's your phone, it's everybody else's phone around you, it's all the cell phone towers, it's all the Wi-Fi, which uses the same frequencies, all, everybody's Wi-Fi that you're exposed to, you yeah. can see it on your phone when you look at the networks. Bluetooth is the same thing, smart meters, baby monitors, cordless phones at home particularly are bad because they're, they're transmitting all the time, even when you're not using them. Um, even microwave ovens, which leak and send microwaves out into the environment and anybody who's standing nearby. So they're saying now that the, the intensity of this radiation compared to a hundred years ago is one, quillion, one quintillion times higher, which is a one with 18 zeros. Right? So this wasn't there a hundred years ago. Right? Um, and so if you believe that we're an electromagnetic being, which we are, because we measure the electricity with our electrocardiograms, electromyograms, sorry, 
electroencephalograms, electrocardiograms, electromyograms. We measure all that electricity that we operate on. Mm -hmm. And whenever you have electricity, you have magnetism. And we operate on magnetism. You can measure it in the body and around. Everybody has a magnetic field around them generated by their body. Okay. Um, and that, that whole system evolved in a particular environment. We've just re very recently, in evolutionary terms, very, very recently, changed that whole environment. So you'd be thinking there's some sort of... Uh, going to be some sort of negative interaction possibly and you're absolutely right and the biologists have worked out now the mechanisms by which the invisible radiation that we can't see without a machine to transduce it into a form we can perceive um, the mechanisms by which it causes physical damage to us and leads to cancers and heart attacks and strokes and uh, dementia and, and there's, a, there's a multiple mechanisms but one of the the main ones seems to be uh, voltage-gated calcium channels. Mm -hmm. So uh, what that means is on, on the surface of your cells, especially cells that transmit electricity along the surface like nerve and muscle, so nerve in your brain, your spine, your peripheral nerves, and all your muscles, whether it's heart muscle, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle of your gut, um, they all have uh, these voltage-gated calcium channels and, and they're there on purpose so that when an electrical signal, which often starts in the brain, travels down a nerve, gets transmitted to a muscle or even along the nerve, that electrical signal causes these voltage-gated calcium channels to open and increase calcium flow inside the cell. And when that message happens at the right time and the right frequency, you, you get the right amount of calcium going in. And calcium, in the case of muscle, causes the muscle to contract. But it's also a signaling molecule. It turns on a lot of processes in the cells to enable the muscle to contract and work properly, yeah. for instance, in muscle, same in nerves. But it, it, as it turns out, and there, there are lots of voltage-gated channels, not just calcium channels, there's voltage-gated sodium channels, potassium channels, chloride channels that all control the, the inflow or outflow of these ions into cells and affect cell function. So if you're exposed to an electrical field, especially when it's you know, a quintillion times higher than the one that we evolved to, that activates these voltage-gated calcium channels. Now you've got ions moving in and out of cells inappropriately, mm -hmm. doing damage. And in the case of calcium, if you have too much calcium coming into cells, it turns on an enzyme called nitric oxide synthetase, which makes a molecule called nitric oxide, which in excess gets converted into a free radical called peroxynitrate, which is a very powerful free radical, which is so small it can actually translate across cell membranes, so mitochondrial membranes, DNA membranes. And being a free radical, it causes oxidative stress, inflammation and damage. So that we end up seeing the damage. That's one of the mechanisms that the invisible radiation that we can't see ends up causing physical damage that we do eventually become aware of as cells and tissues start to fail. Mm. Um, so, so that's, uh, that's the, uh, uh, one of the toxins, the neurotoxic factors that, uh, that we're, we're big on assessing people's environments, particularly to measure your sleep space, because that's the most important space. It, and uh, uh, as you know, 95% of bedrooms have unsafe levels of man-made yeah. radiation in them because the builders don't know about it. Nobody can see it, smell it, taste it or hear it. Nobody knows it's there. But it's, it is, and if it's in your bedroom space, that you get a double whammy there because of the amount of time that you spend in that space. If you're exposed to man-made radiation and getting all this inflammatory oxidative stress caused, A, it's doing physical damage to your body, B, it's actually turning off your repair processes because your brain sees this radiation, doesn't know what it was because it wasn't on the planet 100 years ago, yeah. thinks it's sunlight, which is the radiation that it does know about, and um, so, and sunlight means it's daytime. So daytime means we don't repair and regenerate. That's what we do at nighttime. So you turn off your repair and regeneration processes. So you might find you, it's harder to get to sleep, it's uh, and harder to stay asleep, and you wake up um, unrefreshed yeah. because because you're not regenerating and repairing. That's where melatonin sits in, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So <clears throat> what, one of the measures of that, one of the one of the best measures of that, is that your melatonin production, which is the hormone that your brain releases to tell your body that it's night time and now we're going to get into repair mode. And melatonin is a strong antioxidant, especially in the brain. It's a very strong anti-inflammatory antioxidant by itself. 
as well as being a signaling molecule to your gut and, and your immune system, that now's the time to regenerate and repair. And so if your brain thinks it's daytime, you don't make melatonin, you can measure that. And, and for people who are electro hypersensitive, which is about three to five percent of the population and growing as we're getting more and more radiation exposures over our life, um, they don't make melatonin and they can't live in the city and they can't be around cell phones or any source of man-made radiation. They have to go and live in a forest in a tent, otherwise they're really sick. And many of them who can't do that, they just end up committing suicide because life is just, it's untenable for them. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to see more and more of those people, I think, as the radiation levels in the environment continue to grow exponentially. And I think when the, um, a, couple of de a couple of years when the 5G network comes on. So at the moment, telecommunication, uh, the Wi-Fi and, and the cell phones, uh, they're using the, with the 2G, 3G and 4G networks, they're, they're using uh, centimetre wavelengths, microwaves. But the 5G network is using millimetre wavelengths. So they're 10 times higher frequencies, which means 10 times higher energy. So that's great because you can carry more information. You can download your movie faster. You've got better, yeah. better bandwidth, but it's not good for cells. And, and it's not just human cells. This is... Um, all forms of life on the planet all get affected and they're all being damaged. So plants, our food supply, animals, even bacteria. There's studies showing that bacteria are becoming more, one of the reasons they're becoming more antibiotic resistant is because of the stress that's been applied to them by this radiation and they're reacting to that stress and, and becoming more virulent and aggressive and more invasive. And there's you know, thoughts that the mold that is, is quite common in water damaged buildings, uh, you only need to have um, water on, on building material for 24 hours for mold to start growing on it um, and and the, particularly the problem with uh, the, the downside of having energy efficient houses which are very enclosed is that if you get any moisture in through leaky roof leaky pipes you know the, the waterproofing in the shower wasn't done properly and it leaks through into the building material that any mold that grows makes things called mycotoxins, which are toxins that stop the mold from, or other molds growing on the same patch. So a mold, all molds on water damaged buildings make mycotoxins and often a range of them to stop other molds growing on its patch. But these mycotoxins are nanoparticles and they aerosolize and you don't have to see or smell the mold. It can be in the ceiling space, in the wall cavity, subfloor, um, but the toxins aerosolize, get into the living space, then you inhale it. And 24% of people have genes, that have inherited genes, that they don't remove these toxins effectively. So their immune system gets activated to try and get rid of the toxins, mm -hmm. but can't, especially if they keep coming in, and people often don't know because you can't see or smell it. Um, and so it, it promotes inflammation, which then leads to problems throughout their body. Mm -hmm. so, so the reason, the connection with the radiation is that the, uh, the mold, being a living organism, is aware of this man-made radiation and sees it as a threat to its survival, which it is, same as it is to ours, and um, uh, becomes more virulent and active and throws, it's, it's under threat. Well, what do I do when I'm under threat? Well, I'll throw out a lot of mold spores and try and colonize somewhere else, and I'll throw out a lot of toxins to protect from the threats that I'm used to seeing. Yeah. And, but when we get the collateral damage. So that's another example of, um, you know, that depends on who you speak to, that um, most buildings, well, sorry, 10 to 40% of buildings have water damage, depending on the studies you look at. So it's quite common. Um, and so that's another neurotoxic factor that's in the environment that if you want to have a healthy body and a healthy brain, you have to assess it and remediate it if necessary. I mean, other toxins are, uh, are the heavy metals that, that we're, we're pumping out in the environment now because of all the processing we've done. W ones that we know of and that we see a lot of is high levels of aluminium. So uh, you know, aluminium was, is bound to silicon in the Earth's crust and it's one of the commonest metals in the Earth's crust. But when we dig it up and pull the silicon off it, and um, we use the aluminium for all sorts of things, in cooking ware and paints and, and deodorants and um, and it get, ends up in the atmosphere and in the water supply and therefore in the food supply and then we ingest it. So, and we know that alum, uh, aluminium, even vac vaccinations in kids, aluminium is used as an adjuvant <coughs> to irritate the immune system so <laughs> that it 
it will react to the <laughs> antigen that you want it to react to. But especially in kids, they don't have good barriers to stop the aluminium going where it's not supposed to be. And, and it's, it, it's an inflammatory to the immune system. That's why we give it, but that's not why we want it to stay in the body and yeah. keep doing that for the rest of your life. And, and other ones, uh, most people are aware of mercury from amalgams and uh, to, uh, from fish, but particularly the big fish. So the longer lived, big mouth, larger fish, you know, uh, swordfish, marlin, shark, shark or flake, uh, even the salmon um, have relatively high levels of mercury now because it's in the water, they can't avoid it. Um, and uh, the mercury is very neurotoxic to the brain. So if it comes in via sil the silver fillings, which are 50% mercury and which release the mercury um, all the time and more so when you chew on them or heat them up with hot food or drink, uh, the mercury that ends up in the brain kills brain cells and it's just another one of the neurotoxic factors that we've all got, we've all probably got hundreds of them, <laughs> but we all have our own levels and it just depends on what we've got and how well we balance them with the neurotrophic protective anti-inflammatory factors that determines um, whether our brain's working and, and whether off we're killing off brain cells faster than normal. Yeah. So in... Um <coughs> Um, you know, with dementia, which of course nobody wants, um, you know, a little bit like brushing your teeth. You, do, you brush your teeth because you want to have a, a you know, fresh smelling breath, but mm. you know, at some level you don't want to have those brown teeth that you see in the dental magazines when you're in the waiting room. Yeah. Um, so what are some things that people could kind of pull into their lives that you know would you say that's kind of a good practice to do yeah. for brain health okay. uh, and maybe specifically the dementia which sure. uh, yeah, nobody wants yeah well, funny you say the teeth because oral health is really important for brain health um, one of the ways that you can accelerate the death of your brain cells is to get infections in the brain not the gross infection that causes causes encephalitis and gives you high fevers and blinding headache and paralysis and you get straight to hospital, but low grade chronic infections that they're now finding that, that can survive in the brain long term uh, via different mechanisms that different microorganisms have to evade your immune system. So there, there are a range of uh, microorganisms um, and uh, viruses and even fungi that can hide from your immune system in different parts of your body like your brain and just sit there constantly sending out toxins and, and just triggering the immune system because the immune system sees there's something wrong but it can't get rid of the thing that's wrong yeah. so it keeps doing its, its programmed neuroinflammation thing trying to clean up but getting collateral damage in the process and, and the, the two the studies at the moment show the two major ones and there'll be many more I'm sure in the future are the herpes simplex virus so the virus that gives you cold sores which travels along the nerves into the brain and can sit there and just as cold sores can reactivate on the skin, they can reactivate, the herpes virus can reactivate in your brain and you get recurrent basically little cold sores in your brain each time doing damage, each time spreading the virus a bit further. Um, so you know we know that people who have uh, herpes simplex virus exposure uh, have increased risk of dementia, particularly if they have the main inherited risk factor. So in terms of dementia, um, only about 10% of it is inherited. There's about 100 genes that predispose you to dementia, but that's only 10% of the story. 90% of dementia is you give it to yourself by what you've done to your brain over your life. Good and bad stuff imbalances. Okay. Huh? But of the inherited roughly 100 genes that, that contribute to heavily to 10% of dementia, uh, the APOE gene is the main one. And the APOE gene, as with all genes, you get one version from mum, one version from dad, and it comes in three forms, what they call E2, E3, and E4. So you've got one of those from mum, one from dad. So you might be a 3-3, or 3-2, or 4-3, or whatever, everybody's different. Yeah. Now it turns out that the E4 version causes, uh, addition, uh, promotes inflammation in the body. So when you get an inflammatory trigger, like an infection or trauma, you'll have a stronger inflammatory response if, if you're an E4. So, and that then leads to uh, uh, more cardiovascular disease in E4s and more dementia in E4s. 
So if you have no E4, so you like a 3-3, which is a very common one, you've got about a 9% risk of dementia. But if you have one E4, you have a 30% risk of dementia. And if you have two E4s, you have a 50 to 90% risk of dementia. So even if you have two E4s, that means you have a 10 to 50% risk of not getting dementia. So it's not a guaranteed death sentence, it's just yeah. it's a predisposition which you then need to manage by putting in a bunch of anti-inflammatory stuff so that you go from the 50 to 90% of E4-4s who get dementia to the 10 to 50% who don't get it. You can, you can do that by manipulating your environment and all the good stuff and bad stuff. The reason I went on to that was that one of the things the E4 does is it makes it 12 times easier for the herpes simplex virus to get into brain cells. So that's one of the ways by which it promotes that infection getting into brains and then over time neuroinflammation and brain Is it death. something you can get tested for? What Any you doctor can order a, a, a E4 gene test, yeah. You can get it as an isolated test or you can get it as part of different panels that um, can be done on, on blood tests or, or skin samples from the cheek. Okay, so be, you know, when you have children that would be an interesting thing yeah. to find out about them. Yeah, well particularly if there's um, <coughs> If dementia runs in the family, that might be that everybody's got a really lousy environment, you know, the, all, you know, not enough good stuff, too much bad stuff. Or it might be that there's a genetic predisposition that's being transferred down the gene line. Yeah. And uh, so if that's the case, if you have that genetic predisposition, for some people say you can't change the genes, doesn't make any difference, I'll just do what I can do. Um, and then other people say, well, yes, you can't change the genes, but if I know I have a gene that predisposes for something, I know I need to work harder than yeah. the normal per person that I see around me Cause, to cause stop me getting that disease. Because those percentages you mentioned, that's reflective of the average person who doesn't yeah. know about anything out yeah. there in, in the average environment. That's right. And so if you know, then you can take steps to put yourself into the healthy cohort rather than the Yeah, and the that percentage one. would then obviously get less yeah. amongst those people that are aware of it. That's right. That's right. So yeah, so I, I think we can't test all the genes, um, many of them are just sort of at research levels at the moment. Uh, well, you can get all your genes, um, some, um, if you do sort of gene sequencing like 23andMe, but uh, we don't really know, you know percentage-wise and how they interact. You know, if you have this two genes, how's that compared with having three of these genes or one of these genes? And all that stuff is still yet to be worked out, but uh, I, I think the if if there's cognitive decline or dementia in the family or you're particularly worried about that you might be declining faster than you should be then it, it's worth knowing but that's not the only test that's like a, a secondary test you want to do all the test all your hormones test for infections um, inflammatory markers get an idea of how much inflammation is going on in your body so going back to the dental thing so um, if you have infections in your mouth either infections in the teeth that need fillings mm -hmm. or infections in the gum called gingivitis which causes bleeding and pain when you brush or floss or infections in the bone underneath the tooth which often you don't know because you don't feel it and the dentist can't see it. Those infections uh, because of the damage to the associated blood vessels and the growth of the overgrowth of the bacteria the bacteria get into the blood and they travel around your body. So they end up in your brain, they end up in your blood vessels. And we've known for decades that if you have dental disease, oral disease, that you have an increased risk of heart attack, stroke, dementia. Um, and um, if you've had teeth removed in early to midlife uh, because of infections, not because of trauma, but because of infections, you have twice of the risk of dementia in late life because the infections early in life have opportunity to get in the brain and, and accelerate the decline. And uh, you know, studies show that uh, if you look at the brains of demented people after they die on autopsy, mm -hmm. they have three to eight times higher level of oral bacteria in their brains than people who don't get dementia. And so the way the bugs get into the brain, as I said, is through dental disease, oral ill health. And so optimizing your oral health is really important. And if you've had root canals, which are dead teeth and, and have bacteria in them, living in them, multiplying and traveling out to the rest of the body. If you've had fillings, um, forget about the mercury side of things, but just the fact that you've needed to have a filling means the tooth has been damaged and infected, mm -hmm. promoting inflammation flow. If you've got 
or had uh, gingivitis and pain and bleeding with brushing and flossing, or you know, I, I get all my people to do a cone beam CT, so it's a, it's a high resolution but low radiation picture of their teeth and the bones underneath the teeth. And it's amazing how many times you have infections in the bones underneath the root canal tooth. So the root canal tooth is infected by, it's a dead tooth, it has to be, but it then leads to infections in the bone and abscesses that you can see on the CT. Uh, and, and reasonably often it, teeth that have had fillings and crowns in the past, i.e. infections, the infection can translate either around the tooth through the gum or through the tooth, the root pulp in the middle and set up home in the bone underneath. So, so oral health is, is one of the things you need to do. But in terms of the big picture, if you look at the good things that you need to have a long, healthy life, yeah. not just brain function, but bones, muscles, liver, heart, cardiovascular system, a whole lot, um, and, and roughly in order of importance, um, I think it's exposure to natural sunlight and earthing. So earthing is where you touch the earth, or the surface of the earth with your uh, bare skin and you get exposed to the natural magnetic field and, and some electrons that come in from the surface of the earth into your body, uh, which is how we evolved. We evolved earthing all the time. We'd walk around in bare feet, sleep yeah. on the ground. Now we never touch the earth. So earthing puts you in touch with the earth's magnetic field, which we use and need. Um, and being out in the sun and getting sun on your eyes and on your skin puts us in touch with those frequencies of energy which we use. So sunlight is absorbed by the skin and used. Um, similar, as, just as plants do, plants and us, we all evolve from the same origin. Plants use sunlight to, uh, to combine uh, carbon dioxide and water together in the process of photosynthesis, which means grabbing a photon of light and synthesizing a bigger molecule from carbon dioxide and water. But basically photosynthesis is storing sunlight. So you want to keep the energy levels in your body as high as possible. The way you keep the energy levels as high as possible is, is A, use the energy that you've got effectively, but get energy in because we're always using it up. So we always have to keep it coming in. And the three ways that you can get energy into your body is sunlight on your skin, um, and uh, the, the frequencies of sunlight from the infrared up through the visible and the ultraviolet, we have ways of using that energy within our cells and within our mitochondria and within the, the fluid of the cells to hold that um, as a charge, to store that energy to be used. Um, so getting out in the sun, not hiding from the sun, not getting burnt and damaged from it, but not hiding from it uh, and touching the earth, I think are really powerful, cheap, easy things. Um, and the best time to get out in the sun is first thing in the morning because uh, of the, the balance between the frequencies in sunlight changes during the day and uh, um, in the morning it's very safe but it's also very effective and it helps set your circadian rhythm which means it tells your brain that the day started so your brain tells the body the day started so you turn all, on all the things you need to do during the day which is be the best hunter gatherer on the planet. And Conversely, avoiding sunlight, particularly blue light, the blue part of the natural frequency of uh, visible light, is the frequency that we use to monitor sunlight, like daytime. Mm -hmm. So the eye picks up blue light and the brain picks up the, from the eye and that tells the brain it's daytime. And so for millions of years, when the sun went down, there was no blue light because there was no sunlight. And so that tells the brain, okay, now no, no need to activate the body to be a hunter-gatherer it's dark, now we're going to into, repair into the repair moment. cycle. Repair, regeneration, detoxification cycle. Um, but if we expose ourselves to blue light after sunset, then that's telling the brain it's daytime. So we turn off all the repair and regeneration stuff. And so we don't, uh, we don't, we find it harder to get to sleep, we don't sleep as deeply, we don't regenerate as well. So avoiding particularly blue light on your eyes and on your skin because of the message, the signals, signaling happening through the skin, um, after sunset is, is a really cheap, easy thing to do. So something like just having long sleeves on and long pants on after sunset to avoid the artificial lights that we're surrounding ourselves with now with our screens and our internal lighting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and having a barrier over your eyes. So either of remove blue light from your environment, 
which you can do. Uh, there's, there's apps you can put on um, uh, computers and phones, but a cheap, easy way is just turn off all the bright white. So the bright white LEDs in screens and, and internal lighting have a lot of blue in them, huge amount of blue. And so that's, that blue light actually does damage when it's, in, when it's unbalanced with the other frequencies. It damages our mitochondria and it leads to changes in shape in the eyeball. So that's why you're seeing so many kids now who are myopic, they need glasses. Like when we went to school, how many kids had glasses? Oh, a couple. Yeah, now it's half the class needs glasses. So but, but that's the blue light changing the, the shape of the eyeball so you can't focus properly. You need a lens to help you. Um, but it also does damage to your mitochondria and to your whole cells. And after sunset, it tells your brain it's daytime so you don't get proper regeneration and repair. Um, so that's their cheap, easy hacks. Uh, oh, so, so, so the two ways got diverted. The three ways you get energy into your body are touching the earth and getting in touch with the earth's magnetic field and getting sun on your eyes and your skin and mm. using that radiation uh, as we have for millions of years until we started living and working indoors and putting clothes on and hiding from the sun. And then the fourth way is just food, which is frozen sunlight via photosynthesis. Sunlight is frozen and stored and then when we eat that food, we pull it apart and release the energy and use it. Okay, and then we breathe out the carbon dioxide and the water. Actually, the water is really important because the, the water that we make from food is not just a waste product as, as, it, as we were taught in chemistry. It's, it's, uh, it's what's called deuterium depleted water. It has low levels of deuterium in it, um, which the water in the environment from, uh, that we drink has relatively high levels of deuterium. And deuterium stop the cells from working properly when you have too much deuterium. And particularly in Australia, our rainwater, because of the hole in the ozone layer, uh, our rainwater has a high amount of deuterium, which means our drinking water and our plants have it, therefore we have it, and that's contributing to um, mitochondrial dysfunction and not enough energy and accelerated wear and tear of our cells. So having low, so, so the, the when, when we um, make water from pulling apart food, frozen food, or frozen sun in food, that water is relatively deuterium deep, depleted, which is good, uh, but it depends on the food that you're eating. So if you're eating grains and fruits and, eat, and potatoes, they have a lot of deuterium in them. Therefore, the water you make in the process of breaking those foods down for the energy that's stored in them will have high deuterium. Whereas uh, vegetables and nuts and seeds and grass-fed organic animals, they have um, fats and uh, proteins that have relatively low amounts of deuterium, therefore you have good quality water being made from it. Okay. So this is getting into a bit of, sort of biophysics, which is relatively new stuff, but uh, it, it's just an indicator. You know, the more we look into the detail, the more the basics become the bang for the buck stuff. Hmm. There's never going to be a drug and there's never going to be a combination of drugs that fix up all the hundred things that cause dementia. It's just not going to happen. Um, you, you've got to address the underlying causes. But the vast majority of the underlying causes are relatively simple to address. So it's, it's that sun exposure, earth exposure. It's, uh, then it's moving your body and exercise. So moving is important because that makes you healthy. So standing and walking as much as you can, you get a lot of health benefits from that, as opposed to sitting and lying, which most people do about 22 or three hours of the day. Mm. Right? That's mm. not what a hunter-gatherer did. That's not how we evolved to be like that. So that's a problem. And then there's the high intensity exercise. So, so movement makes you healthy, exercise makes you fit. If you want a long, healthy life, you have both. So moving is like being a gatherer and exercising is like being a hunter. It's the high intensity stuff, short duration. And they all have benefits and you need a bit of both to be optimally healthy. Um, you know, we talked about the sleep, we talked about the radiation, you know, identifying sources of foreign molecules in, that are coming into your body. Foreign molecules are perceived by your immune system as, this is not me, this is not something I recognize as a food or a nutrient, therefore it's a foreign invader. What do I do when I see a foreign invader? Attack, inflammation. inflammation. Yeah. And if it keeps coming in, I will keep attacking until I win and it's gone. But if the environment is such that it's just always coming in, you'll always be doing it. And so there's a hundred thousand chemicals in the environment now that weren't here a hundred years ago. And only 
a couple of thousand of them have been tested on humans because the idea was that we wouldn't be eating them. They'd be used in industrial processes. However, from the industrial process, they end up in the water supply, the air supply, the food supply. They end up in us. So most of them have not been tested. We don't know what they do. We just know they're foreign. And we certainly don't know what the interactions are when you get two or three or four of them together. Between, yeah. I mean, kids, there's a study done where they looked at the chemicals, man-made chemicals, in children at birth. And they only tested 400 and something chemicals. But there were 300 and something in children at birth. So these kids are... That, so the kids now, you know, they're, they're not only are they born into a toxic environment, but even in the womb, there was a toxic environment from what mum was exposed to, and all this radiation. When, when we were in the first couple of decades of our life, the radiation levels were relatively low before the microwaves took off with telecommunication and yep. mobile phones. But these kids have had it from in the womb, mm. and the kids are most susceptible to this radiation because they're, they're, the thickness of their skull plate is thinner, and that's, that helps protect. So. A phone held a certain distance away from a child's head, more of the radiation from that phone will get into the child's brain than an adult's brain. Um, their, their cells um, have more water in them, so that makes them more susceptible to the, the radiation. And their cells are turning over faster, which makes them more susceptible to the damage that's been caused by this radiation. So I think we're going to see in this current generation a lot of degenerative diseases uh, happening years to decades earlier. I mean, well, we're already seeing it. We're seeing uh, neurodevelopmental diseases and neurodegenerative diseases going through the roof. Neurodevelopmental diseases like aut autism yeah. is, is just exploding in the last couple of decades. And that's, that just means the brain's not developing. Not enough good stuff, too much bad stuff. And neurodegenerative diseases, which end up as dementia and brain failure, they're also becoming... Um, in Australia, they're the second largest cause of death, and there's a forecast they'll be the largest in, in, a, in a couple of decades. Um, and so neurodegenerative diseases are not enough good stuff, too much bad stuff. So autism is just dementia in a kid, and, and dementia is autism in, a, in, a, in an older person. It's, it's mm -hmm. not, able in, not able to grow and de declining too rapidly. And it's all environmental. It's, it's all changing in a couple of decades. Our genes, it's not genetic. Our genes haven't changed in a couple of decades, but our environment has changed tremendously. So if you want to be healthy, you have to take your environment as back as, as far as possible to the environment your body evolved in. And you can't go back to it unless you want to live as a hunter-gatherer in the jungle. But even the jungles have got chemicals and radiation in them now everywhere on the planet. But um, so you can't, you can't, eliminate all these sources but you can minimize them and it comes down to a choice between convenience and health mm. it's convenient to take the elevator it's healthy to take the stairs it's convenient to pour your breakfast out of a packet that was made months ago months somewhere ago. else in the world it's healthy to make it from real food freshly bought um, in season locally and it's convenient to be connected to the net and communicate and be and wirelessly, be wirelessly, and be it. People can contact you anytime they want. It's not healthy being exposed to that radiation. So everybody has to make their own decision about where along that continuum they want to go. Um, but uh, the more you go down to convenience, as a general rule, the less health you'll have, and the more degenerative diseases you'll have, and you'll be paying eventually. It might be uh, expensive in the short term to prevent it. But you're, just, you're not eliminating the cost by not doing it. You're just delaying the cost to later on in your life when you have to spend a lot of time and money, when you can't work, when somebody has to care for you, they can't work, when you've got all these medical expenses that um, often you didn't need to have. It was because of decisions that you've made over your life that's predisposed you to getting those. So you're going to pay at one end usually you're going to pay a lot more later. <laughs> yeah, if you do it now, it's an instalment plan. It's a small instalment plan, a smaller amount, yeah, and you can keep working. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, if you, if you get sick and you can't work or you're not productive as you need to be, then, uh, yeah. It's even harder. Yeah. All right, uh, John, thank you very much for, uh, for all the input you've given. I think that's a nice uh, 
uh, summary to, to end up. Yeah. Now, um, you do a lot of consulting, uh, of course, in person, but also over the internet using Skype and facilities like that. Yeah. So um, if somebody um, wanted to get in contact with you or, or, or ask for your assistance, uh, how would they go about that and how do they contact you? Easiest way is just to go to our website. It's uh, www.heart, H-A-R-T, clinic, one word, .com.au. And that gives you an idea of some of the things we do. It gives us a, there's a phone number, there's an email there that you can contact a reception and they can, you can give them an idea of uh, if you don't know uh, what you want to do or uh, what, what might be involved. Um, we've got very good staff here that uh, we spend a lot of time with people. We're not, um, we're not five minute consults. You know, our initial consults are an hour and a half to two hours and uh, it's very detailed and we do a lot of testing. You know, I like to test, not guess. So mm -hmm. I don't want to take a guess at what's wrong with you. I want to know, and the technology gives me a lot of information. So as, as, as much as the patient's um, resources will allow, we'll do hard objective testing to work out exactly what's going on. And that usually then means that the treatments are much cheaper because you know what you have to do. You're not treating things that you didn't have to treat because you guessed that they were wrong. Targeted. It's yeah. a very targeted, cheaper, more effective. And, and, then, and if you've identified things that are broken with the testing, you can then retest them some months later to show that you fixed them. Make progress. Yeah. yeah. Quite wonderful. Well, I, I certainly know all the patients of yours that I deal with, uh, you know, speak very highly of you. So uh, thank you very much for your time and, and the insight you've shared. And uh, yeah, it was awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. That was the interview with Dr. Hart of the Hart Clinic. What a knowledgeable and helpful man. For more information about this podcast and a transcript, please head to www.healthstronghold.com slash Dr. Hart. Please subscribe to this channel so you're kept posted on future episodes and look up some of the amazing content already shared on previous episodes. We'll see you again next time.